Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our first official launch of the Postgraduate Student Affairs Book Club webinar, an initiative by the Office of the Dean of Student Affairs. My name is Vuyo Magibi, a Master's Student in Cultural Policy and Management at the Witt School of Arts, and I am Program Director for this session. Today, we have the honor of launching a very provocative yet timely and essential book in the new democratic dispensation titled The New Apartheid by our very own wiser postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Sizem Ofu Walsh, who will be engaging us further on his book. Please note that the session is an hour long and students are invited to engage fully in the session by using the chat function in the chat box and Q&A section. Additionally, questions directed to our panel members must be posted in the Q&A session. Please allow for two, uh, sorry, we will allow for two live questions in the session. Please remember to be brief and concise when asking your questions to ensure that we do not exceed our allocated time. And lastly, we will do our best to ensure that all questions are answered by our panel. Without any further ado, I would now like to hand over to our wonderful Dean of Student Affairs, Mr. Jerome September, to give his welcome remarks. Over to you, Dean. Good afternoon. Thank you, Vuetu. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this inaugural book club. Um, that we're hoping to host um, regularly on the WITS campus, particularly targeting um, postgraduate students. The idea of this book club is really born out of the need for us to create an environment in which we critically engage around topical issues in our country, on our continent, and in the world, and particularly to do so in support of those who are brave to put their thoughts to paper um, through books and through other pieces of literature um, that we have available. This is part of an initiative for us at WITS at least to think about how we um, engage postgrad students, how we relate to postgrad students, but also how we push postgrad students to think about their place in the world, to contribute to, to public debate, to public discourse. And so I hope that these webinars will become very popular and that once we're in a position where everyone can return to campus, that we will at that point also begin to think about um, doing this in person because that would, I, that would be first prize. I am of course very excited that we're doing this launch event with Dr. Siswe and Paul for Walsh. He is someone that I've known for a while, whose journey I have watched, and he is certainly someone that has, in a very short space of time, captured public imagination in terms of um, contributing to how we think about our democracy, to answering key questions in terms of our democracy, but to also help us think beyond the rainbowism that we always associate um, with our journey to where we are today. This book makes us think quite deeply. It makes us think about the kind of democracy that we're busy constructing, the kind of society that we're constructing, our own place in this democracy, the systems that we've put in, the laws, the extent of those and the relationship of those rather with our past and how we take or not some of our past into our present and into our future. And so a very provocative book from someone who is one of our own. And so I hope that through this event that you will be stimulated and that you will ask the questions, engage with him and, and, uh, and, and think through and even challenge some of his thinking in terms of what he has put forward. So thank you, Dr. Walsh, for joining us this afternoon. And a thank you also to our, other, to our students, Bongani and Busisiwe, who will join us soon for when we approached you for raising your hand. Bongani in particular, as Busisiwe isn't with us yet, um, I'm admired by how you raise critical questions, uh, particularly recently around graduate employment, but about our place in, in, in society, the deep questions you ask. During the unrest in July, how you went into community to tell the stories, to, to, to critically think about what was happening and to highlight that through your own media platforms. We are honored that you are here and I want to thank you for that. 
um, there will be books given to the to participants. So please be on the look, please engage. We've got about, we've got quite a few copies of the book that we will be able uh, to give to students. So welcome to this event and thank you very much to both our speaker and our, um, our two respondents, our program director, Rebecca in, the, in our office who will help us over the next few weeks and months think through this um, in terms of postgrad support. Thank you to all of you, our marketing team and everyone for making this happen. Our deputy dean will take over later on with a formal vote of thanks, but I just thought it was important that, that I acknowledge you. My role of D as dean is to create the platform. It's not for me to dominate the space, but it's to create the platform for young people to engage. And I hope that you will grab this opportunity this afternoon to engage, to put your thoughts forward, to challenge one another um, around those ideas in the interest of building, not just our university, but also building our country and our society. Thank you and welcome. Thank you very much, Dean, for that warm welcome. And I would now like to introduce our man of the moment, the author himself. Dr. Susan Bofo Walsh is a South African scholar, author, and commentator. He holds a doctorate of philosophy in international relations from the University of Oxford. His debut book, Democracy and Delusion, won the City Press Tafelberg Nonfiction Award. Mbofo Walsh's popular YouTube channel explores South African politics. He has been described by author Mark Hafisa as one of the most gifted writing, uh, writers of his generation. A very warm welcome to you, Dr. Mbofu Walsh, and thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thanks so much, uh, Vuyo. Thanks to everybody who's joined us today. My particular appreciation and many thanks returned uh, to Jerome September, who's been uh, a key source of support right from the days when I was a student at UCT. And it's wonderful to see the, the fascinating and, and excellent work that he's now doing as Dean of Student Affairs. And to everyone at Student Affairs for coordinating this event, uh, planning the logistics. Thank you very much for bringing us together today for this conversation. Uh, before I begin, and again, by way of preface, let me also thank um, Bongani Mahlangu for uh, agreeing to be an interlocutor today. I very much look forward to engaging. Thank you for making the time for this and engaging with the work as well as Busisiwe. And I very much look forward to hearing from you now. Jerome has encouraged you um, to challenge what I say. Um, however, I will remind you that I decide who gets the books. So you can, you can be nice or, or, or you can challenge. The decision is yours. Um, I jest, I jest, but I, I look forward to, to our engagements and thank you all for taking the time um, to speak today um, and, and to be part of this event. I'm going to offer you some brief reflections on my new book, The New Apartheid. And of course, in a, in a talk as, as short as this, I'll be somewhere around 15 minutes um, or less. I can only be telegraphic. And so I would encourage you to read the book to get all the nuances of the arguments, which I, I won't be able to convey um, fully in this talk. But I'd like to give you a flavor for the book a flavor for the work um, and a deeper insight into the aims and ambitions around the work as well. And I'll do that essentially in, in three parts. First, I'll talk about what this book seeks to achieve and what I set out to do when I embarked on this project. Secondly, I'll then look at some of the different chapters in the book and try to give you a sense of how the argument unfolds in the middle parts and passages of the book where I look at several different cases. And then finally, come to some of the concluding thoughts um, at which I arrive in the book. But before I go into those three sections, 
I thought it would be useful to tell you a little bit of the story of how the book came about, because mindful that the audience is predominantly postgraduate students, I think it's really uh, important to think of your postgraduate years as a profoundly formative moment in your own intellectual development. And hopefully to use this book as a source of inspiration for the books that you might want to write and the works that you might want to produce. Uh, this book is intimately tied to my own postgraduate experience to the extent that it is the first work I've produced just after finishing my PhD. But I couldn't have produced this work without being a postgraduate student, learning the, the arts of deep research and writing for an academic and a public audience at the same time. And so as you go through your postgraduate training, sometimes it can feel a little bit abstract. You know, what am I doing this for? Why am I, why am I doing this? Um, but if you can tie what you're learning to a, a broader set of goals, a broader project, then you can see that what you're learning now allows you to do so much more with, uh, with public discourse. And I hope that you too will soon be uh, talking about your books if you haven't already written them. And uh, just remember that your postgraduate experience prepares you perfectly um, to write a book of this kind. This book came about after my first book, Democracy and Delusion. And that book was really a look uh, and a set of essays about hot topics in South African politics. There was an essay on Marikana, there was an essay on uh, fees must fall, or at least uh, free education and its feasibility. There was an essay on, on questions of corruption. But after finishing that work, I was left with a residual frustration. And that is that far too much, I think, of our public discourse revolves around questions which hug headlines. And of course, these questions are important, but it seemed to me that they were symptomatic of a deeper malaise, which has gone unspoken since 1994. And that it's time for us to try to name the crisis that lies underneath the crises which bubble to the surface. And that was really what I set out to do. So let me, let me begin by speaking about the aims of this book. Well, the aim of the book is to name that crisis, to frame that crisis, and to develop a new conceptual landscape upon which we can start to have a more critical conversation about the brokenness of South Africa's democratic project. And in order to do that, I think we need to be far more bold in naming the problems which we see around us. It's all well and good to speak of unemployment, inequality and poverty. It's all well and good to talk of corruption. It's all well and good to talk of various forms of racialized, gendered violence. And to be sure, these are crises which deserve great attention, care, and urgency. But in my view, they stem from deeper wells of unrest, which in turn stem from a fundamental crisis at the root of our society, which I call the new apartheid. And the idea behind developing the idea of, of the new apartheid or the concept of the new apartheid is to try and center a multitude of problems around one central idea so that we can ultimately embark on the project of uprooting the new apartheid once we have underst understood it. In creating this theoretical framework of the new apartheid, there are two subsidiary ambitions. The first is to take apartheid seriously again. Ironically, since 1994, 
it seems to me that apartheid has become simultaneously omnipresent, in other words, all around us, while also being invisible, so that we know it's always looming in the background, but we never actually name it, bring it out into the foreground, look at it in the eye and, and discuss it. And so we need to take apartheid seriously as a project. The apartheid project was a monumental project in its scale. It was a multi-generational project and it was a deep philosophical project, a social project, a legal project, an economic project, a project which reached into the most intimate aspects of people's lives and zoomed out right into the, the macroeconomic uh, conditions of South African society. And towards the late 1980s, Apartheid's architects foresaw that a democratic society was on the horizon. But their goal, and I trace this in excruciating detail as I go into the Apartheid archive, their goal was to implant Apartheid so deeply into South African society that no democratic government would be capable of uprooting it. And effectively in the book, what I try to do is assess whether that ambition has actually been achieved. That despite the celebration of South Africa's democratic passage, despite the passage of South Africa's democratic constitution, at the root of South Africa's deep socioeconomic and political crises is a persistent res residue of apartheid. And not just the legacy of apartheid, but the way that apartheid itself is a way is able to adapt around democratic constraints, take on a new life and revive itself even under a democratic dispensation. And ultimately naming something by its name, I think is an extremely important act, calling a thing a thing as one of my recent interlocutors suggested is what we're called to do. And unless we can find the bravery to describe the situation as it truly is, then we will be forever confounded by uh, our lack of imagination in tackling the problem. If we misdiagnose the problem and underdiagnose the crisis and assume that we live in the afterglow of, of, of a miracle, then we cannot be surprised when the miracle continues to disappoint us. So that's just a brief overview of the intention of the book. And what you'll see uh, is in the introductory chapter, I then try to develop this concept of the new apartheid. Um, I want to just give you a little taste of how that, how that section goes. Um, because ultimately what I try to show is that the replacement of apartheid or the, the, the repeal of apartheid laws has come to be uh, replaced with financial entry criteria, which often mimic the, the exclusions created through apartheid. So for example, in the introduction, I say that Apartheid was marketized because privilege is now policed by price rather than prose. The market, not the state, now dictates the boundaries of opportunity and financial barriers have replaced legal edicts as the key instrument of segregation. Where there is an application, there is a financial regulation and where there is a financial regulation, there was once a racial law. The exchange of racial laws for financial barriers benefited apartheid interests. The policing of racial statutes is a costly business, morally and financially. By contrast, financial barriers carry neither moral shame and impose financial cost. By replacing legal barriers with financial ones, 
segregation is transformed from a public burden into a source of private profit. In classic neoliberal fashion, apartheid oppression now works on a pay-as-you-go basis. That's just a sample of the introduction. Uh, read it for a, a much deeper reflection. Um, but I'd like to take, uh, take you through what I then do in some of the other chapters in, in very short order. Um, what I then try to do in the book is say, OK, I've developed the idea of the new apartheid. Where does it work in practice? And so there are five chapters which try to explore um, the new apartheid uh, as it actually occurs in South Africa today. The first chapter deals with space, and I trace the continued segregation in urban and rural South Africa, um, which has persisted to shocking degrees, um, and I think would shock many when, when you look at some of the data. I then look at questions of law, assessing whether the constitution is capable of uprooting the persistent patterns of apartheid which continue to persist. Then there's a chapter on wealth, which is probably the most well-known argument in this realm, the persistent uh, patterns of wealth inequality which map onto apartheid injustices. There's a chapter on technology, which assesses how our increasingly digital lives also reinforce and remake some of the spatial and the physical patterns of apartheid that we see. And then finally, there's a chapter on punishment, which looks at the way that we use the criminal justice system to punish disproportionately uh, petty crimes and have created a system of impunity for the powerful, which draws on deeper uh, forms of impunity, which were created under apartheid itself. And then finally, I conclude this talk and the book um, with a reflection on where we go from here. And really what I try to suggest is that tinkering with the margins of, of public policy will not get us anywhere. Rather, what we're called on to do is to fundamentally reimagine South Africa from the bottom up or the country that we currently know as South Africa. And what I propose is a new republic. And what I mean by that in brief is that what we are currently living through now would be the first democratic republic. It was a noble experiment. We tried our best, but it was fundamentally uh, a failure. And now we need to completely reconceive and rethink a new democratic republic, which builds on the gains of 1994 and beyond, but also transcends many of the limitations as they concern apartheid injustices and is much more ambitious about uprooting apartheid than we have been in the first democratic republic. And so I'll end roughly where the book ends uh, before I open up um, the conversation to the interlocutors. Um, and, and let me end how I end. This book on page 179 is not about solving South Africa's problems. It is about defining its central problem. Before we can dream of defeating the new apartheid, we must first behold its monumental scale and omnidirectional reach. Overcoming the new apartheid will require breathtaking imagination and unmatched wisdom over several generations. It demands the painful reassessment of long-held creeds. The defeat of the new apartheid requires all the fortitude of a new liberation movement fixed on the ideal of a second true independence. For, in the words of Professor Shireen Hassim, also a Witz, quote, the central question of our time is, what is it that people were struggling for over centuries and what have we got? Thank you. Looking forward to our chat. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Mpofu, um, Walt, for those remarks and for the uh, brilliant overview of your overview of your book. I will now we are now moving on to introducing at this very moment um, our two student panel members. 
Um, so we have Busisiwe Catherine Siebe, a powerhouse whose activism knows no bounds, from giving masterclasses on Black radical feminism and decolonization, to conducting research for the Gauteng Provincial Legislature, to serving as an on-screen analyst for a number of television and radio stations in South Africa. A national hashtag fees must fall student leader and runner up of SABC's one day leader reality show, Busisiwe is a global ambassador for the Always Keeping Girls in School campaign. For her efforts, Busisiwe has won numerous international plaudits, including the Cosmopolitan Change Agents Award in 2018, due to her tireless work advocating for the rights of girl children and social justice. You can follow Busisiwe um, on Twitter and her handle is at ms underscore bcrb. Our second panel member is Bongani Mathangu, a PhD candidate in, in, in economics with a focus on carbon economics, which is development in environment and energy economics at the Witt School of Economics and Finance. He holds a Master's of Commerce in Economics, formerly served as the Northwest University SRC President and the National Executive Council, Council Member of the South African Union of Students. He currently serves as a school governing body cha uh, chairperson of Dinodo Technical Secondary. Bongani also provides independent economic commentary and analysis. His interests lie in education, youth unemployment, politics, and socioeconomic well being of poor households and their intersectionality of everything of which he writes extensively on. I would also like to extend an apology to Bongani. Um, his bio initially was, was in, would rather was written incorrectly because it stated that he's a PhD in philosophy candidate um, as opposed to PhD in economics, All right? So I will now like to hand over to our first speaker, which will be Ubongani as our student panelist. Over to you, Bongani. Um. Okay, no, thank you very much. Um, thank you for the invitation. Um, and also thank you for the author, um, for your intellectual property. I don't know if I can be seen, but it's fine. Um, so to, okay, no, thanks, noted. Um, so that was just the greetings because I have so little time. I just had to summarize that. But um, to start it all off, I think I will start it with a quote from Robert Subuku in his SRC inauguration speech of 1949 when he says that, okay. okay, thanks. So when he says that, um, for we are concerned not um, with personalities, but with policies, um, and there has been no change in this respect. So basically here, Robert Sebuko speaks about that we can engage on characters as much as we like, but if policies remain the same, then everything else remains the same. So I think um, this is something that I pick up from the book as well. Um, but interestingly enough is that in South Africa today, where there is policy progress, there are incompetent individuals in those positions to implement the policy, which brings us back to the old status quo, which then brings us to um, the new apartheid. So I also like how the book makes a logical connection of everything, um, space, law, finances, and how they come together, and how it was properly researched and brings context and some... Uh, puts formally the conversations that we have in, on our dinner tables. So to get into some of the things that I had noted from the book, and I'm glad that the author did make citations of those as well, when he spoke, when he spoke about um, financial barriers um, to replace racial laws, I mean, we have seen how financial barriers of entry in South Africa prevent the majority of South Africans who just happen to be African or Black from accessing a lot of things, in particular, institutions of higher learning today. That's why every beginning of an academic year, it starts off with protests. And the protest is basically to say, um, remove the financial barriers that exist. So still a black child finds it um, extremely hard to access these institutions in 2021. Um, probably next year we'll see the same as well. So just to also go on some of the notes that I made, um, the author speaks about um, oppression is undercover, or uh, is under the cover of um, constitutional order. Um, which is very true. Um, the author also speaks about that you, it is hard to distinguish between liberators and oppressors today, which goes back to, says, uh, to say that the worst kind of oppressor is someone who was formerly oppressed because the assumption 
is that um, today, this day and age, there would be progress. But then if we cannot distinguish between our liberators and our oppressors in the men of um, social mobility for the majority of our people, then it's problematic. And I will link that later to a point um, that I picked up from Cornell's West, um, Cornel West book, which says um, race titled Race Matters. But to continue, the author also speaks about that apartheid was a state ideology. And a question then is asked as to what is the state ideology of today? Because there seems to not be any state ideology. So apartheid was clear and within its clarity, every citizen in the country knew what the government's objectives were, whether you agreed with them or not, whether they benefited you or not. But today there is confusion as to what are the interests of the state when majority of um, people still um, remain in a regressing um, socio-economic uh, socio um, conundrum. Um, and that also links, as I said, there's a logical connection to everything that the author raises, which I, I found it interesting to the financial barriers that exist. In space, um, interesting enough, the author and Peck's about the quasi-independent municipality known as Orania. Um, he speaks about how Orania was developed, it was deliberate, it was intentional. And I link this to the new developments of today. I mean, if you go to your waterfall cities and other um, new development um, of today, you would in, in South Africa, you would find that these new developments, these new cities, these new towns that have been built because of the financial barriers that exist in those towns, the majority of our people cannot access those towns. Um, so as much as a few may, may be able to access um, but a majority cannot be able to access. And that again leads to exclusivity. That again leads to financial barriers that exist that a certain racial groups are trapped in certain geographies, whereas other racial groups uh, thrive in other geographies. So I found that to be interesting as well. The author speaks about explicit and um, external, implicit and internal which speaks to, which says to me, um, institutional racism. Um, it reminded me of a time when I worked at a certain bank and all the directors at that bank, a well-known bank in South Africa, all the directors happened to hold a certain identity group in terms of race and they were white. Um, and it told me as a person that, as an African person that regardless of how much you may work, but you'll never access a certain level of responsibility at this institution. And interestingly enough, at the very same institution, institution, um, the very same directors, the average um, high, uh, highest qualification was metric, but because of race, they made it there and the argument was that they have experience. So this to, um, links then to what the author then calls um, implicit and um, internal um, 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 racism. And then also, I like how the author speaks about the centers of economic privilege, um, and then all, which links to what I, I said earlier about um, this new development and um, the barriers of entry for certain people at these new developments also speaks about numerical minority, which in turn is cultural majority. And it reminded me of um, um, Antonio Gramsci's work when he speaks about the hegemon, that whoever is in charge um, of a society um, in terms of commerce, economics, finance, determines everything else in terms of education, in terms of literature. That is why today you would find the decolonization of education struggle still taking place, where we are saying do away with the Western canon. So um, Antonio Gramsci, and also this uh, um, um, citation made by the, content, uh, the author has a very logical relationship of which um, took me back to other things that I've read in previous years. Um, on page 49 of the book, um, the author speaks about um, racial segre um, rural segregation. And um, we all know that because of rural segregation, which is the breeding ground of tribalism, something we often do not want to speak of as African people, um, the author unpacks it very nicely. And um, with, if you read that page and then you use it as a, a tool to analyze what had happened, I think several months ago at the Northwest University when there was a removal of a statue that represented the old Bantustan government. Um, some people did not understand why the statue had to be removed. They did not understand when arguments were made that the statue is by extension um, um, uh, um, apartheid um, or the Bantustan are but an extension of apartheid. They did not understand how a Bantustan, which caters for an ethnic um, black society is by extension 
um, apartheid. So I think when you engage with page um, 49 going downwards, you then get an understanding as to what is meant and why it is important or was important for the university to shift the stage where it was and remove anything else that re resembles the old Bantu stan. Um, and uh, a point also to note, whereas there is a citation of majority of farm evictions are happening under democracy more than they did apartheid. Um, so which also speaks to what uh, Robert Sibuko spoke about, removing of characters, but policies remain the same. Um, the new oppressor and the new apartheid, and hence um, we still find these facts, we still um, find these evictions taking place. And then, as I said, out of the interest of time, um, uh, earlier on when I spoke about Cornell's West book, um, Race Matters, aside from black nihilism, um, Cornell West makes a, a very profound argument about moral reasoning versus um, racial reasoning. So you'd find that usually racial reasoning is a component of bad identity politics, which um, the problem with identity politics oftentimes is that um, cited from one speaker who said, um, people are avatars of their group identities and have nothing unique to say and communicate between the identity group and whoever is outside of the identity group becomes an enemy. Whoever is inside the identity group becomes a friend. So how do I link that with everything, um, including the, or the book itself, the new apartheid, is that there is no moral basis of why um, the, um, or in fact, in analysis would use first a primarily moral reasoning. So there is no moral basis for this identity group that happens to be black um, in pigment um, and also in demography to be denied access to economic opportunities in this country. There is no moral basis in 2021 for a majority of uh, South Africans who happen to be black to be denied access to certain geographies in this country, to be denied access to certain um, legal benefits in this country. So when you then use moral reasoning as a basis of analysis, it links up to even what Robert Sibukwe said, that you change policy because it is morally correct to do so. Because um, the fear is when we argue just on the basis of color, is that even those that oppressed yesterday and those that oppressed in the new apartheid, or those that benefited still happen to be white under a black government. And everyone is protecting their identity interests that do not have moral justification. So now that is the problem with sometimes using moral reasoning without using, um, uh, without, I mean, using racial reasoning without using moral reasoning. And this extends beyond the book, New, um, the, uh, New Apartheid, but to everywhere else is to say with the LGBTI, for instance, it is, there is no moral justification for killing a person subject to their sexuality. It extends to women as well. There is no moral justification to deny a person um, a, a certain responsibilities in institutions based on their gender. So it is very important that we apply moral reasoning and understanding the new apartheid, understanding Cornell Wells' book on um, uh, uh, race matters, I think it broadens the understanding of an individual and you get to see the world as it is, but also you are um, capacitated to provide solutions as to what needs to happen. And what needs to happen is that there must be a sense of morality brought back into our systems in order to dismantle um, apartheid as we know it, uh, or as, or as he, we have known it, in order to dismantle the new apartheid as the apartheid today has shape shifted, whereas the barriers of entry remain high for the majority of African people. So I will end there, thanks. Thank you very much, Bongani, for that detailed um, review there. I can see so much passion went into it. Um, without any further waste of time, I'd like to now hand over to our second panel member, um, Obusisiwe, to give her review um, and opening remarks. So, Obusisiwe, can you please, uh, because um, you know, with the interest of time, can you please just um, keep it brief and succinct so that we can move further to our Q&A session so that we can open up and engage um, with the rest of the audience? Thank you. Um, if I could just ask the host to start, yeah, because apparently my video could not be started. I think that should be it. Good afternoon, everyone. My sincerest apologies for being late. Um, there's just a whole lot happening with local government elections coming up and, you know, the ANC's lack of electricity and not being able to provide electricity to the people. 
But let's get into the book, right? Um, I was cringing the entire time I was reading this book. And the reason why I was cringing was because of the fact that Caesar speaks and narrates a truth that many of us who are academically inclined um, already know, right? So when he gives a contextual analysis on the constitution, on the law, on the economy, um, and also on things like society as well, from an educational perspective, it's something that we can understand. Uh, but obviously, even with um, you know, all the, the wonderful things that are written in this book, there must be, to some degree, a level of critique. And I hope that I'm able to provide a substantive um, degree of critique of the book. But I think the first thing that I must say is that the depth of analysis um, you know, within this book, uh, as well as the shattering of, the, of my deeply held South African paradigms, are uh, something that I had to grapple with. Right? Um, the author illuminates the links between the ANC and the NP um, negotiations and the current political and social reproduction of apartheid. Um, I left this work with a new way of understanding or necessarily I left, when I finished reading the book, um, it was with an understanding of the country currently known as South Africa, as well as insights on, into how the constitution can play a role in building social, economic and political justice for all, right? So although I might highly recommend the book, I can only highly recommend the book in conjunction with another book that was written by someone I believe that Sizwe knows very well, U Ayanda. Um, U Ayanda writes a book that says, that's called The Economy at My Doorstep. And I think when you read to a large extent, the chapter around wealth, um, in conjunction with the economy at my doorstep, you begin to understand to a large extent um, the, the, the the, the reaching power or the reaching um, legacy of the apartheid era. So one thing that I've noted about the book is that it kept um, emerging from discussions from his first book, Democracy and Delusions, 10 Myths in South African Politics. And I think while unpacking the existence of apartheid in today's climate, the new apartheid takes a step back and tries to define what the central problem in South Africa is right now. I don't believe that it does this ex fully. I don't believe that it does this in a manner that I, um, I'm trying to be very nice, but also critical at the same time um, and also mind my words. So let's get into this. Um, I wanna start with what Bungani said. Um, towards the end of his presentation, he speaks about morality. And I think it is very important for us to understand, first and foremost, that morality is subjective. So if we were to include elements of morality, not only in the constitution, but also in different aspects and different um, systems from the economy to law, we would have to then be able to define the kind of morality we would like to include, considering the fact that morality is so subjective. I will say one thing, however, one of the most interesting um, chapters for me in the book is his chapter on law um, and specifically when he speaks about the vexed interface right um, I appreciate and I understand and I applaud his analysis of the constitution and the reason why I do this is because myself and many other activists have long said that the constitution is a walking contradiction right as a document it contradicts itself on many accounts and I appreciate how Sizwe simplifies um, you know, our assertions that the constitution is a walking contradiction. Um, but specifically what I'd like to note um, is when he speaks about it and he says in, on page 68, he says the constitution is flawed, but the new apartheid would persist even if it were not flawed. Any constitution would battle to defeat the new apartheid. Now that invokes thought, that invokes um, a challenge to some degree from my perspective in the sense that it reminds me of what Fanon once said when he says we must end the world as we know it. And that is the only way for us to be able as black people to emancipate ourselves and to free ourselves. Right? So when Caesar speaks about how there, is, there isn't any constitution that would battle or defeat the new apartheid, it begins to invoke senses of how would we then from Fanon's perspective end the world as we know it? Because Caesar does an amazing thing. He analyzes other constitutions as well, and not necessarily just South Africa's constitution. He looks at um, you know, uh, the European constitution as well. He looks at various constitutions um, that I believe 
South Africa to some degree had taken and drawn example from. But I think we must also remember, and he articulates this beautifully, how to a large degree, it was the national party who won, in Suze's words, um, in, not necessarily the concessions, but one in terms of being able to advocate and to push through their demands, which actually led to economic, um, you know, helmet, right? So this is why to a large extent, you have a situation where white people or the white elites or um, white colonialists or white people in South Africa continue to hold the economy in their hands because largely our freedom was more of a political one. It was a freedom of acquiring votes. It wasn't necessarily a, a freedom of acquiring economic emancipation. And I think that's why political parties like the EFF then arise um, to try and fill that gap because there is a question around what happens to economic freedom? What happens to economic emancipation from a black perspective, right? So in the book, um, he argues that um, the persistence of apartheid, despite how we think we have destroyed and defeated it remains. And I think this argument is spread across five realms of life, which includes space, law, wealth, punishment, and technology. So through the new apartheid, um, CISWA wants to address something that we all know and feel, but are also suppressing. And I think from that assertion that he makes that, that, he makes that we, we can all feel that we all know, but are also suppressing, he does not take into context um, the current lived experience and expression of South Africans on the ground. Um, and I particularly mean in rural areas, in townships, in semi-urban areas, and also in white communities, like the Santon that he speaks about and the Rosebank that he speaks about that have become uh, microcosms of Johannesburg as a CBD. So I think to a large extent, it, it is not a truth to say that we are not addressing or we are suppressing um, you know, the feeling um, and the knowledge that we have that apartheid still exists, I think it is from a perspective that we must consider that South Africans, particularly Black South Africans, and most importantly, Black women in South Africa are in survival mode. And being in survival mode means that we are willing to conform to society, we're willing to conform to the new liberal agenda. And Caesar speaks extensively about the neoliberal agenda and how the neoliberal agenda also to some degree um, played a role in the ending of apartheid, played a role in the construction of the constitution and also played a role to a large extent in the kind of law that we have considering that we have Roman Dutch law. So for me, the book is very in depth for someone who understands or who has gone through first year in politics, or someone who understands or has read about apartheid in high school, they'll be able to engage with the book. But one thing that I am lacking in the book is the role of decoloniality, the role of the decolonial movement that um, started long before the 1980s from my perspective and from the literature that I've read. The decolonial movement to not only decolonize sectors like the economy, law, um, technology, but also decolonize the constitution itself. And I think that is a premise to why many people want to change the constitution. I think also his conversation and assertions around women and the role of women in our society, in technology, in wealth, in geography as well is lacking. And I understand the fact that he can't extensively speak around women or for women because he is not a woman. But I think the little nuances that he gives with regards to the struggle of women leave a lot to the imagination and leave the reader wondering more about you know, um, the feminist movement in South Africa and the decolonial feminist movement specifically and how feminists are now rising up to challenge a lot of what um, he writes about when he speaks in the vexed interface. Um, like I mentioned, the vexed interface is one of my favorite um, parts of the book because he specifically you know, argues around um, private law and public law and the role of private law and public law, not only in the constitution, but also in the economy, in technology, and also uh, around wealth. And I think from that conversation as well, we need to be able to critically analyze the part where he speaks about who won, right? Who won what? So in, on page around, you know, um, 
let me say, after the vexed interface, he speaks about who won what from page 79. And I think for me, when he makes the assertion and the claim that the National Party was able to secure lasting concessions, which dog South Africa to present and are likely con to continue in future, if unacknowledged, it raises the question of, okay, if we acknowledge the, the, the lasting concessions that the NP made, what then happens? I think for me, what I failed to get from this book is a point of departure into what should happen next. And of course, I mean, CISA cannot be a lone man and prescribe to South Africa what should happen. And I think he attempts to answer this question that I am raising with regards to what happens next, what then, when he speaks about the past, present, and the future. And although the past, present, and the future is contextualized in a manner that makes you understand the trajectory and the progress or the, the movement of um, apartheid into, you know, this new apartheid, I think for me, he, he, he doesn't do justice to, especially for cult, uh, because at some point he mentions for cult and he says, as famously, um, as for cult famously suggested, power is not a thing, but a relation. And for me, I don't understand how with power being a relation, how do we then use power as a relation to structure or reconstruct the kind of society we want to live in, the kind of South Africa we want to have. I think for me, um, understanding the fact that, you know, power itself was radically di um, diluted by global and local powers, I fail to, to understand or I fail to receive from the book how we can reconstruct the concept of power, how we can reclaim power if it is something to be reclaimed and how we can possibly use it. Um, I, I'm definitely looking forward to submitting a formal paper um, with regards to my review of the book, which raises different um, questions around decoloniality, which raises questions around the future, which raises questions around the feminist movement, especially now looking at local government elections. And I think although, and you know, Caesar mentions this, that although apartheid is so central to our collective identity as a nation, but also our respective individual identities as people, we don't necessarily know what apartheid is and was in all its complexities. I think that this is a falsehood um, to a large extent, especially for young activists like myself who have experienced apartheid through generations in our family, through close relations. So, and to close off, because I could speak extensively about this book, but to close off, there is a study about the Holocaust, and this study speaks about how the Holocaust is something, is an experience that generations of um, Jews will encounter because it is encoded in their DNA. And I, I believe that to some degree, apartheid is encoded in our DNA as Black people in South Africa, whether we're willing to talk about it, whether we're willing to realize its complexities, I think that it's something that we will carry with us into generations that will follow. Um, and I think for him to say, we don't necessarily know what apartheid is, is a falsehood because apartheid was not just a system, but it was a lifestyle. It was a consciousness. It was a way of being, a way of thinking. And to some degree, it was a culture. And I think lastly, one thing I don't get from the book, and this is something that I was hoping to get, was when he speaks about geography and he speaks about how um, townships and Bantu stands have become to some degree, you know, microcosms that uh, further perpetuate um, the ideals of apartheid. He doesn't speak to me about how tribalism, right? Tribalism as a culture, tribalism as a means of interaction is also part and parcel of, you know, the, 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 the disparities and the kind of complexities that we find in townships and Bantu stands. So from that perspective, I think the book does speak about a lot, but for me, it, 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 it needs more. I need, I need more meat on it. Um, but for someone who is coming into understanding apartheid, coming into understanding you know, um, the social dynamics and the consequences of the apartheid era, I think this book is very informative, but I must say that it also misses the point on common law and contract law. And I think when you read the chapter on law, um, for someone who isn't um, law educated or someone who hasn't gone to law school, you begin to understand the fact that 
he, he gives you a sense of understanding of what common law and contract law is. And that's fantastic because he simplifies it in a language that you know the common man can understand. But I think it is important for us to also recognize that he misses the point of common law and contract law. Um, I think you know, when he contends that apartheid did not die when the constitution was adopted, but rather it was privatized in advancing the central thesis he explores law as one of the pillars of what he terms the new apartheid. Where there is still much to be said about some of the arguments made in the book, um, I think we need to be able to understand the, um, how narrow and modest the book is also in its entirety, right? So because Caesar attempts to provide an analytical account of the role that law plays in abiding and abetting the privatization of apartheid. So naturally we read the chapter closely and enthusiastically while also himself, he wasn't a legal scholar, he makes certain claims about law in the chapter under uh, the vexed interface, like I mentioned, which is one of my favorites, uh, where he discusses the relationship and tension between the constitution and private law, right? It is important at the outset to explain that Caesar takes issue with common law, which he defines as the organic, uncodified body of law that resides in judicial precedence rather than parliamentary enactments. This definition, while not entirely incorrect, is faulty to the extent that it leads Caesar to make erroneous conclusions about the nature and role of common law in present day South Africa. Right? And I think this is something that we should definitely take into cognizance because of the fact that our common law is, is a peculiar mix of Roman Dutch law and English law as applied and developed by South African courts. Right? So while it is true that common law is recorded and can be found in court judgments, it does not follow that any rule of law found in a judgment is pre, um, precedential um, or predates, right? Value forms part of the common law. So the common law consists mainly of laws of the province of Holland as it was in the 17th century. And we'd have to then in depthly go into uh, an understanding of common law and its purpose and its, um, its rise, right? Um, first, the premise begs the question, the constitution is the supreme law, the window of the nation's soul and the mirror in which society views itself. There is only one system of law in South Africa under the constitution and no other law could purport to, uh, to be superior to it. Asking whether constitutional intentions are compatible with the private law inverts the true nature and order of things and begins the argument where it should in fact end. So I think we need to take that into cognizance and rather ask the question of whether the private law itself is compatible with the constitution. When we're able to have those conversations, I think we'll be able to get to a positionality where we better understand the role of private law and common law. Um, but from that perspective, I think I agree with Caesar's assertions that to some degree we need a convention to be able to discuss the new apartheid because it is something that is real. It is something that not only us educated or us um, academics are able to understand and see through literature, but it is the lived experience of our people. It's the lived experience of the people in Alexandra. It's the lived experience of the people in Deep Sweat, in Cosmo, and in other places around the province. And I think when we ignore issues around patriarchy, which plays a very big role in the development of the constitution and how it is enforced, when we ignore how patriarchy also plays a very big role in how the economy is structured and who gets to participate in the economy and to what extent, when we ignore the role of patriarchy, even in the construction of the geography um, of our townships, of our Bantu stands, when we ignore the role of tribalism, when we ignore the role of decoloniality and the project of decoloniality, I think we're moving far away from being able to truly see the new apartheid in its raw and unapologetic form. Thank you. Thank you very much, Busisiwe. That was very well said and well articulated. Now, we have now reached, um, we are running a little bit over time, but we're hoping to um, wrap up the session at quarter past six. So the next 10 minutes will go over to our Q&A session where we'll be taking, we are taking questions from um, the floor. 
Currently, I have nine questions, um, and I think I'm just going to ask all of those questions because they are mainly directed to um, the author. And I guess then the author will decide whether he wants to share, um, you know, answering the questions with his panel members. So the first question is from, let me just get this, Newo Mujanaha. Apologies if I pronounce your surname incorrectly. And um, Newo is asking, has democratic pluralism in South Africa in association to economic and political development been successful? If not, why? Second question by Abram Chauke. Doesn't the problem emanate from the fact that the South African democracy was designed by the same people who were operating the apartheid? Designed, I suppose it's designed to suit the same goals of apartheid, but giving few political privilege with no impact. Alisa is asking, how did you find a balance when coming to the academics and the non-academics without being either too academic or simplistic? And secondly, what were the golden nuggets of doing that? Okay, so I will stop at three questions because I don't want to overload. And um, I will then give, um, open up and hand over to Dr. Mboff Walsh um, to... Thanks very much, uh, Vuyo. Just, just a quick question, how long... Um... All right, so I'll, I'll try and be about five minutes so that we can leave time for, for, for more questions. Um... Okay, doctor. Um... Sorry, just one thing. So in your five minutes, those are just the first three questions. So we still have about um, four more questions to go. So you can answer the first three, maybe in three minutes, and then we'll, you can do your last uh, five or four questions that are remaining in the last maybe two or three minutes of your time. Okay, great. So then maybe at the end, I will come to the, the interventions of the panelists, which I would like to, I'd like to discuss a, a little bit, but I'll do that at the end. Um, <clears throat> Thanks so much. Uh, firstly, before I do get there, let me thank both the panelists um, for uh, fascinating and very fruitful responses to the book. Um, so Mr. Mahlangu, uh, Ms. Siabi, thank you so much for reading the book, engaging with it, and, uh, and you know, very interesting remarks, which I'll get to um, towards the end. For those of us who, for those of you who have asked these questions, um, now, um, I'm going to get to your question last. Um, the question on the design of South Africa's democracy, um, I want to deal with because one thing I want I want to make clear is that this book's argument is is quite a nuanced argument. Um, I'm not making wild claims that I can't back up, and I certainly don't just make the claim that South Africa is exactly the same as it was before 1994. I think in all honesty, we do need to accept the advances that have been made. My problem is not that nothing has changed and that the National Party designed the whole thing. Um, my problem is that we over-celebrate the democratic era and we uh, in that way hide and distract from the ways that some of the goals of the apartheid power structure have actually been preserved into democracy. But what I, what I can only do in, in this amount of time is to point you to a section in the book where I deal with this question at some length. Musisiwe um, touched on it. It's in the law chapter in a section called Who Won What on page 78. So I would commend that section to you because there I go into what did the National Party and what did the forces of apartheid want in the negotiations? What did the ANC and liberation movements uh, want? And what did we end up with? And in that exercise, I show that sometimes the ANC got some concessions and sometimes the forces of apartheid got some concessions. And I tried to show where the apartheid forces won and where they lost and how that affects today. So please check that, that section out on page 78. Palesa, on the question of balancing the voice, um, this, this was such an important uh, consideration. And for those of you who are postgraduate students who also have ambitions to write for a public audience, this is something that you grapple with. Because on the one hand, I was trying to write a complicated book, a, a deep book, a book that's based on 
great academic research. But on the other hand, I didn't want to lose readers in an, in an academic jumble. Um, and so I read very deeply on writing and I've always read very deeply on writing. And I think we focus too little as postgraduate students and as academics on how to make writing clear. And clear writing doesn't mean you use small words. You know, you'll learn a few words when you read this book. It means that you write clear sentences and that your reader can follow your arguments and that you take your reader on a journey, even if that journey sometimes challenges your reader. And the nugget that I'll share with you that was um, the thing that stuck with me the longest was I read a book um, which was about writing as an academic. And the key point that was made is that people always say, find your voice. But the, the truth is that you're a complex person and you actually have many voices. So what you really need to do is find your voices and then choose which of your voices is right for a given project. And in this project, I, I found a voice that, that was unapologetic about being a scholar, but that was also trying to reach out to a broader audience. And, and that's who I am. Um, and, and I'm not going to try and write like I'm someone else. Um, so I think now on the question of democratic pluralism, because I'm not um, sure exactly of what you mean by democratic pluralism, it's going to be hard for me to answer that question. Um, so maybe after this, we can, we can get in touch offline and, and I can engage that more deeply, but uh, I'm just not exactly sure because that term has so many different meanings what exactly uh, you wanted me to, to say on democratic pluralism. Um, what I would say is the section who won what as well deals a lot with the structure of South Africa's democracy and you might find something useful there. Thanks for the questions. Thank you, Dr. Susan Booth Walsh. Okay, so actually um, the next questions or rather the next two questions will be directed to Bongani and Busisiwe um, specifically, also just to give you a breather, Dr. so that you can respond now to their reviews in general, um, incorporating, every, incorporating everything that has been discussed thus far. Um, so to Bongani, um, the question that um, Usia Sianda Madala, Sianda Madala is asking, um, is if within the purview of this talk, how does the welfare, um, welfare state, free education and the like, affect residents psychologically, economically, socially and the like? What does the literature show in, in other spaces that championed welfare? Thanks. Okay, so Bongani, you will have uh, two minutes to respond to that. Kandi, please be brief and stick to the time. If you do go over the two minutes, I'm going to raise my hand. If you ignore my hand, I'm definitely going to put my mic on and remind you that you have run um, over your time. And then while we're at it, can I just already pose the question to Busisiwe? Okay, so <laughs> the question for Busisiwe is coming from um, Ulebo Kheng Jongane. And Ulebukheng is asking, Guti, in your thought, do you think our constitution was written to uproot apartheid or to reach a compromise of some sort? And um, the reason I'm giving you this question, Busi, is because you brought sort of like, uh, you told us what the book did not address or what you would have liked to see more of. So um, I think that would be a nice, um, you know, a question for you to engage with and sort of like come and provide, as I've seen in the chat as well, um, you know, people are saying this work is very theoretical and, um, you know, it doesn't provide any solutions. So what are the practical solutions really to the problem and the crisis that we're sitting with now, um, which I suppose is very relevant, but I will give over to Ubongani to to answer and then once Bongani is done, we'll see where you can go on immediately after Obongani, and then Dr. Mpofu will then take over the floor. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I'm just going to be very brief. Um, so basically, we all know that um, free education just means um, greater access. So it's not basically free because someone pays, and usually it's the taxpayer that pays, and that payment comes due to transfer payments that are uh, um, generated or retrieved as form of revenue from taxpayers. And then the very same person that would have been a beneficiary of such policies will ultimately become a taxpayer themselves due to upward um, social mobility. And then the cycle continues. So I doubt it would be psychologically a policy or an action that would make one undermine themselves as a beneficiary of such a policy because ultimately they would also give back into 
through the system in one in one form of or, or another due to the same transfer payments. Thanks. Thank you. Again, love. Okay. Um, all right, Busi. So your question from Ule Bukheng, uh, Chongkane. She's asking, oh, no, let me not say that. Um, Ule Bukheng is asking, in your thought, do you think our constitution was written to uproot apartheid or to reach a compromise of some sort? Well, I believe that it was written to do neither of those things, actually. Um, I think to a large extent, it was written mostly to uphold a colonial um, legacy that has now become more economic in its view um, than it is social. So I don't think that the, the constitution was to a large extent a compromise or a coalition of ideals. But I think that to a large extent it is there and it is maintained and used to pacify black people, right? To pacify us in the sense that it does connotate some of the, the, the aspirations that we have as a nation, as black people, but it does not tangibly or does not provide us with tangible uh, means to achieve a lot of what is written in the document. So the fact that it is intangible um, leads me to understand or to conclude that the constitution was not written for either. I think more than anything, the constitution was written to be able to maneuver the new apartheid into its current system um, and uphold it in its place. Thank you, Busisiwe. Dr. Mpofu Walsh, you can um, come in and uh, provide your response to I mean, the, your reviewers' uh, reviews and feedback. Thanks very much. And, and let me also uh, say thank you very much, Dr. Zamini, for joining. Um, I'm, I'm searching for, for the title of the book, um, which I read three or four years ago, but I will, I will add it to the chat. So thanks for joining and thanks for your question too. I just wanted to say um, thank you very much to the, to the panelists for, for your engagements. Um, and Bongani, I wanted to uh, just you know, reiterate the importance of some of the work you've spoken about, Cornell West's Race Matters, I think is a really interesting book to juxtapose against this, this work. Um, Sobukwe, uh, very interesting biographies of Sobukwe, someone who went through the Wits community um, and Wits University. Um, I think also another key point of reference for me, but also really interesting to read against the idea of the new about it. So thanks for bringing that up. There was so much that you said, um, but I wanted to just pick up very briefly two things. Firstly, the, the or Oranya section. And we must be under no illusion, there is a project underway to effectively break away, if not officially, then unofficially from South Africa. Uh, and this breakaway is not a traditional secession. It is seceding into enclaves of privilege that are fragmented and broken around all of South Africa. Uh, and the solidarity movement, uh, which Afri Forum forms part and very, various other movements are not shy about this. They say, ultimately our goal is to break away from South Africa to be totally independent of the South African state while remaining in the state. And this is a very dangerous project which we need to keep a close eye on because it's a new evolution of the apartheid um, ideal. And then finally, when you spoke about um, privilege and, and space, what I really tried to say in the book is that although we have deracialized spaces of privilege often, we have not deracialized oppression. And so that really creates a paradox because we look at spaces of privilege and we see, oh, okay, sometimes there are black people there. Sometimes there are women there. Um, if we're really lucky, sometimes there are black women there. But just because spaces of privilege have become deracialized does not mean that oppression has changed its character. And so privileged spaces start to become uh, a veneer. In other words, they start to deflect and, and distract from the way that oppression is still gendered and racialized. And that we need to keep our eye on. To Busisiwa's comments, um, I thank her again for raising the question of, of Ayabonga, uh, not Ayanda, uh, Tawe's book, which I think is a really important book for this, um, a really uh, important 
uh, question to raise in relation to the, the different works. Um, and I welcome so much of what she said about the book. Um, the question of patriarchy and gender, um, I think is, is central and important. And one thing I tried to do, perhaps unsuccessfully, was not to have a section or a chapter um, about gender or, or questions of patriarchy, but rather to try and infuse the analysis at different points with this question. And I do try to do this in multiple places in the book, um, but I take your point that perhaps I don't go far enough. And I think that that's a really useful critique and one that I think would be fruitful going forward as this debate unfolds. And I really look forward to, to what you write to what you write about that. Um, but I would, I would urge people who read this book to, to look through each of the chapters and see the way that I do try to bring that analysis in. Because uh, while I accept the point, I, I don't think it's fair to say that I ignore questions of patriarchy or questions of, of tribalism uh, for that matter. They aren't ignored, um, but we, we could debate whether they're dealt with um, in sufficient, uh, in sufficient depth. Um, but on where I take issue, I think, is, is with your legal analysis. Um, because on the one hand, you suggested that you enjoyed the vexed interface chapter. And then on the other hand, it seemed to me that you read a large section of a Mail and Guardian article, which dealt with the book, uh, the first four or five paragraphs of that article. And that article um, actually makes the opposite argument to the argument made in the vexed interface. And so I think that we do need to engage with the way that the common law draws from colonial roots. And to suggest that the constitution is capable in practice of uprooting the deep colonial legacies, which are embedded in our common law, embedded in our legal cultures, embedded in the designs of our courtrooms, embedded in, in, our, in our legal languages, and embedded in our legal inheritances, I think is antithetical to the decolonial project. And so what I tried to do is actually show how uh, colonial legacies in our law, through the common law and through uh, judicial precedents and through various legal inheritances, have a deep impact on South African law in practice, even though in theory, the constitution is supposed to be supreme. And I think that that analysis is something I'm, I'm quite uh, intent on, on trying to defend because I think people uh, give the constitution too much credit for how, for how it has overcome legal legacies. Um, and, and I take serious issue with that article uh, in the Mail and Guardian that you read from um, because I think it, it, it ignores the uh, colonial legacies of South African law. Um, and then, yeah, just finally, I think there were, there were various other really fascinating points in the comments that I'd like to you know, acknowledge and, and thank people for. Um, I can't get to them all, but yeah, just to say thank you to, to both panelists, to, to uh, student affairs and to everyone for engaging the work so deeply. Um, and I hope we can continue the conversation on social media um, and, and beyond. Thank you very much, Doug. Certainly the conversation has to continue on social media. I mean, the topic is so um, deep and there are so many layers of complexity that are layered into it. So, I mean, an hour and a half, even an hour is just never enough for such an engagement. Um, in my own view, personally, this was a brilliant book and I think you're a genius doc. So I am very much honored and thank you very much for um, taking time out to join us today. I'd now like to hand over to Usus Tembi who will then be announcing our winners, um, our book winners for this evening. Um, Usus Tembi, over to you. Thank you, Buyo. Um, Okay, our book winners, uh, who are each going to be recipients of a signed copy of the new update, are as follows. 
We had uh, 15 copies available, and so we will have 11 book winners announced today, and then the other, um, the other four book winners will be identified um, by the panelists after this uh, webinar. So I'll just read the winners for today. Um, Neo Mojanaha, Abraham Chauke, Olebocheng Jongane, Didiro Leruele, Fano Musha Fam. Musha Fam Namadi, Ezekiel Kikana, Sianda Madala. Um, there is a, a person in the in the room named Palesa. No, um, there's no surname, but we will contact you after this to get in touch. Um, Loazi Mshambi, Garabo Born, and Dimokazo Sema. Thank you. Thank you, Vuyo. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Oscar Benice. <laughs> I wasn't aware you were almost done there. Okay, so a uh, big round of applause to all our winners. Um, guys, I hope you enjoy the book. I mean, it's brilliant. I've read it and oh my word. Yeah, I am in awe. I mean, the writing style to like just the creativity, um, how well balanced it is in terms of academia and creative writing or writing for a public. But um, I mean, oh, that was just a beautiful piece of work. Okay, so without any further, further ado, I would like now to hand over to our Deputy Dean, Chekhovacho Mukhaladi, to give um, our vote of thanks. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, Program Director. I'm not sure if I'm, I'm visible on the other side, but just to um, extend our gratitude to Dr. Mbofu. Welsh for coming through and sharing your thoughts in a very well percolated and very well articulated uh, presentation that you have made tonight. I think it has challenged all of us and the students who, who have joined us today to reflect deeply in our writing as we are undertaking our various um, and the genius of writing in the academia to write for the audience and to subject ourselves to the criticism and, and the feedback, robust feedback that was given by our panelists this afternoon, Bongani and Musisiwa. I think your reflection was quite very elaborate and, and, and very in, in interactive. And I've particularly enjoyed how you um, demonstrated um, your reflections through articulating your own perspectives around the book that is wonderfully percolated by Dr. Mbuku. Thank you so much. And congratulations to our winners, and um, um, our students particularly who turned up in their numbers to um, support this grant initiative that has been undertaken by our Dean of Students who has had um, a very powerful foresight in, in, in setting this up um, in, in support of our postgraduate students to challenge and bring them closer to the table as conversant in this ongoing journey of lifelong journey, I mean a lifelong learning journey. And much thanks to the I mean to the organizers, Tembi and Rebecca, for, for putting this up. It was quite very interesting and it was very powerful. And let me not forget to thank you, um, the program director, for the sterling work that you've done in steering this particular program up until to this end to, to today. Just from our part, we want to urge the students to be on cons consistent checkout of their emails to look out for the announcement of the postgraduate book club sessions like this one. Um, I'm, 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 I'm notified that the next um, engagement of this similar kind will be taking place on the 27th of this very month around it, almost the very same, same time. So look out on your um, emails and you, you could potentially be winning much books as you, you, you gain much more knowledge from, from, from the authors of these particular books. Thank you so much. And I guess the event for today is agent. Thank you. That is correct. Thank you for coming. Good evening, everyone. Goodbye. Bye.